Um, hello, hello everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'm just going to give one minute more for people to join, and then we will start. So, um, hello everyone, and thank you so much. Welcome to the Art and Industry Post-Colonial Landscapes in India and Wales panel. Um, I am Gemma. I work as exhibition assistant at Vivian Art Gallery. Um, if you if you don't know the um, Glyn Vivian, is a Swansea Council Gallery, is the local gallery. Uh, and a center of excellence for the visual arts in Swansea. Uh, that way we also play a role in the ecosystem of arts in the whole of Wales. And um, we are thrilled to present today this um, thought-provoking panel with um, Dr. Zara Jumaboy, um, art historian and curator from uh, Bristol University. Um, uh, Dr. Samuel Rayburn, art historian at Aberystwyth University, and Kerry Thompson, curator at Big Pit, the National Core Museum. Thank you so much uh, for being here today. Um, unfortunately, um, artist Abby Paulson won't be able to join us um, as she came down with COVID yesterday. Um, so we really hope she will feel better soon. And um, so, see you soon, Abby. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> um, I'm just going to say a few words um, about the project and then I'll hand over to uh, Zara. Um, the uh, structure of the panel today will just be um, Zara Juma Boy and then Kerry Thompson, Samuel Brayburn, and then we will have 10 minutes for questions at the end. Um, so, about the project. Um, <clears throat> In 2020, Glyndiran Art Gallery and Science Gallery Bengaluru have been awarded a grant from British Council Wales uh, called Connection Through Culture, India Wales. And uh, this collaboration between the galleries, the Museum Society of Mumbai, of Mumbai and art historian Zara Jumaboy has been exploring art and industry in India and Wales. Um, as a result of this collaboration, uh, we will be launching a new website where you will be able to find all the resources produced during the project. Um, and our partners of Science Gallery uh, will host uh, an in-person panel next week um, called Black Call, White Cube at Bangalore International Centre. Um, and the recording of the event will be available on the website as this panel. Um, please check our website and social media for for, the, uh, for more information. Uh, so now I'm just really pleased to uh, introduce you uh, Zara Jumabai and the other panelists who will explore the modern and contemporary art of Indian Wales, as well as their debt to their often shared industrial past and present. So thank you all for joining us today. And thank you so much to the panelists. And a final thank uh, to British Council Wales for supporting the project. Thanks to Ferosa, and of course to our partners as Science Gallery Bengaluru. Um. Okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, seem to be having weird things happening with my internet today. Um, so I'm just going to share this screen and sort of start in terms of give you a little bit of uh, sort of conceptual background, both to the show itself 
which is here we are, as well as this panel and how we're sort of connecting it with um, a uh, kind of uh, equivalences between uh, India and Wales. So um, in many ways, the sort of idea of uh, um, sort of teaming up with the Science Gallery um, in Bangalore and um, Firoza Godridge in uh, Bombay was, um, you know, part of a longer project that Katie and I have been involved with called Imperial Subjects, um, which was also started through a series of uh, panel discussions. And then we're going to be putting together a show, which will now happen in 2024. And so... <laughs> Um, this is all, you know, in, in some ways, this research very much grew out of this kind of collaborative looking at, you know, where Wales shares things in common with India, both in terms of a colonial encounter, which I think we're gathering more and more information about. And perhaps um, this is something that Samuel's paper will discuss a little bit in terms of the sublime and, you know, landscape traditions. Um, but the other thing that we were really keen to explore um, was with uh, the way in which uh, there, there continue to be equivalences. And what I'm not seeing, and I hope you agree at the end of my 15 minutes that it's more complicated than this. Um, what I'm not saying is that Wales is a post-colonial country in the same way that India is. And I know in different ways, this is a rather uh, polemic uh, dialogue because there will be people who tell you, you know, Wales, England's colony. Um, I think uh, personally that it's it is a little bit more complicated than that. It's not in it's not in it, there isn't an equivalence in that sense, but they. But I think it is indisputable that there are similarities in um, some of the problems that um, are, are faced with uh, the industrial landscape and what sort of happened to it. And this is one specific area that we're actually going to be focusing on today. So um, as far as uh, um, some of the works that I'm showing you now are going, uh, what they're going to do is that I'm going to take off from the exhibition we've got at the Glen Vivian Gallery at the moment, which is called Art and Industry, um, Stories from South Wales. And um, it's purely a collection-based show that the a team put together um, looking at um, the sort of industrial history um, of South Wales, but specifically through um, uh, uh, ideas of landscape painting that will go against the narrative of Wales as a sort of wild, untrammeled, um, sublime space that doesn't account for the Industrial Revolution, which was very much at the forefront um, of the British Empire, really, is the sort of argument that we're making with these um, images on the wall. So, um, Taking off from that, I will give you examples from the show, and then I will also stretch these to show you how we can actually find a, a, a similar or different um, pattern as to the industrial landscape um, and the post-industrial landscape of India today. So a few things um, that we're looking at. So here I'm giving you an image, which is not the image we used on the poster, so quite deliberately. Um, of uh, James Harris Sr. And this says Hafford Copper Works River um, Towie. So this is actually looking at the famous uh, Swansea Copper Works, which were actually owned by the Glyn Vivians, um, the very same people who funded the gallery, so Richard Glyn Vivians family. Um, and so this is kind of like the heart of the dialogue of um, industrial Wales, and I just also wanted to point out that the reason that um, you know we we I chose this image was to show you what Swansea Port would have looked like, um, and to show you uh, the internationalism of this dialogue as well. So if we're talking about industrial South Wales, then we're also talking about um, the way in which Wales was connected to the outside world. Um, this period uh, to a wider British Empire. Um, and so, okay. So this is uh, the uh, an image of Bombay, 
on the Malabar coast. And it's an image from the East India Company of, of uh, England, interesting um, use of England. Um, and here is our, here are images from the exhibition of some of the archival material that we got um, to look from the Swansea Museum, looking at um, a, a Swansea uh, port, but also at the uh, steelworks, Port Talbot steelworks, and the entire sort of uh, region around. So you can actually see, um, you know, in, uh, kind of industrial rails in operation from this area. And just to show you that the equivalences uh, continue in many ways. And this is uh, a rather contemporary picture uh, of Tata steel. And um, the uh, South Asians among you will obviously know that Tata steel is a uh, Bombay, um, you know, uh, uh, the, the Tatas are famously a Bombay um, uh, Parsi family. And they are also very, very important to uh, this area as the major employer in um, um, in uh, the uh, in their in their steel in their in in their steel works. Um, and so here is a picture of them, and this is a very proud announcement that came out a couple of years ago of Tata Steel and Associated British Ports have entered into a new and improved tenure agreement. So just for those of you who think that this dialogue is a, is a sort of dated one, um, just to show you that no, it isn't, it's still rather important. So some of the things that I'm arguing, for both India and Wales, the industrial past has contemporary relevant, relevance. Port Albert Steelworks is still a major employer in South Wales, and now the tables have turned, though. It is owned by Tata Steel, an Indian company which belongs to the famous old Parsi family of South Bombay, who established themselves in the port city in colonial times. Thus, industrial relations between India and Wales continue to impinge on the economic prosperity of both. Yet the subject has generally been overlooked in art historical scholarship. So my section here will explore modern and contemporary art from India and Wales as it addresses the industrial landscape. It will track the politics of such works, which often deal with marginalized or deliberately forgotten histories. Artists featured in this talk will include, from the Welsh side, Vincent Evans, uh, Jack Crabtree, and Joseph Herman, all featured in the exhibition Art and Industry Stories from South Wales, currently at the Glyn Vivian Art Gallery, as well as Indian artists, um, particularly the painter uh, Sudhir Patwadan, um, and uh, a major retrospective that he had um, uh, a, a, a couple of years ago, which we've got really good images of, that look at the changing in uh, landscape of uh, Bombay. And then um, I'll give you uh, a little sort of equivalence before um, before uh, inviting Kerry to speak um, on uh, the sort of the, the mill workers strikes in Bombay, but how in the 80s and how you can actually see the resonance, um, a, a sort of a similar kind of equivalence going on also in the 80s under Thatcherism with um, the, the, uh, the mine, mining strikes that happened um, uh, in, in South Wales. Well, all over really, but so, uh, we're particularly concentrating on South Wales. So here's a little image of, um, uh, which I found of a group of mills under the agency of Karim Boy. So this is actually my grandmother's family. So I thought interesting to put it up here. So these were sort of major um, textile mill owners. And also rather interestingly, like, like the Tatas, like um, uh, they're sort of all of these kind of old uh, Bombay families, um, their industrial input starts also through the East India Company and through trade. So much like the old families of Swansea, um, you have a similar kind of equivalence happening here where it's the trading interest that then kickstart um, um, other, other things. And this is also partly what we're examining in the larger Glen Vivian project of, you know, how these trading, um, uh, how these 
trading um, uh, uh, relationships also had an impact on empire and some of the sort of more uh, guilty histories of empire. But here are the textile mills. And here is a work by Sudhir Patwadan, um, who is a Bombay-based artist, um, but he was also a migrant in 1973, he comes from Pune into uh, Bombay. And the reason that I keep saying Bombay instead of Mumbai um, is also partly because, um, well, it's mostly because I have a particular political orientation, um, which supports a much more cosmopolitan idea of the city, something that draws on this past, this past, um, and, um, also, quite frankly, because the lower Perel uh, districts that are being discussed um, are very, very much part of that old South Bombay, which is in itself, um, after the textile mill, mill uh, worker strikes, that is the Bombay that uh, changes, right, gets uh, decimated. Um, and perhaps you can sort of link the, for, the, the founding of Mumbai as a new financial capital to that period. Um, so uh, here you have Sudhir Patwadan's very, very famous and much beloved painting of Lower Perel, looking at the textile mills. It's done in 2001, so very far after this area has um, already suffered the, the textile mill strikes in the 80s. And what you have here is a sort of balancing of old and new, but it's the last sort of vestiges of uh, textile, the, the sort of, uh, um, you know, industrial Bombay. Um, and here you can sort of see uh, the, 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 the way that the painting itself is rather layered. Um, and this is something that we're going to be noticing more and more in Sudhir's work as it develops. And hence, I wanted to show you the retrospective, some images from the retrospective, um, because it's very much a kind of layering of the city, um, of a new city built upon uh, the rubric, as it were, visual, um, as well as uh, conceptual, um, a new city built upon the old. So like Mumbai as a financial uh, capital and of skyscrapers and shopping malls um, being built on what this area, um, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 the dying of this area gives rise to. Um, Okay, and so this is another uh, image of Sudhir Patwadan. This is his show, Walking Through Seoul City at the National Gallery of Modern Art. It was a, a retrospective that um, I've got sent pictures of, um, and these are some of the pictures that the Guild Art Gallery sent me. It was curated by a very well-known Indian art historian called Nancy Adajanya. And by all accounts, and from I think the pictures that we can see, it was an app, it was a very, very, touching and beautifully displayed show. Show it was uh, Sudhir's first retrospective, even though he's so distinguished. And I just wanted you to pay attention to a, certain, uh, a few things. So I will point them out to you because we'll be looking at a few equivalences now um, between Sudhir's work and some of the works inside um, the, the Glyn Vivian show. So if you uh, look at uh, this work over here, for instance, the presentation of the um, aging um, uh, sort of laboring body, that's something that we, we sort of discuss quite a lot in, in the Glenn Vivian show, Art and Industry. Um, and I'm going to read you out a quote uh, um, from Sudhir about what he says about his view of labor, which I think is quite important to us. This painting, Olasnagar, is made at exactly the same time as Lower Perel. Um, how did we get here? Um, and yeah. So um, it's again this a sort of uh, a, a, a very panoramic view where more obviously you can see old and new, you can see the railways. Um, I've particularly given you this weird angle lens so that you can sort of see the development here. Um, uh, and uh, here you have the high rises coming up. And then this is a much more recent work um, where 
there's a there's a more obvious sense of montage uh, going on. You know, the city is literally higgledy piggledy being built on top of each other, and this is something else that uh, we'll discuss in the context of um, a work by Jack uh, um, uh, Crabtree in the Glendivian Shore. Um, so these are some of the things that were said about the Shore. And here again, I just wanted to give you a close-up picture of the idea of labor um, and the, the sort of the laboring uh, body. And so uh, here is a quote that I found um, from, uh, from Sudhir of what he talks about um, when, you know, he, when he looks at the idea of labor and the body. Uh, Yes. So uh, this is a quote that comes from an interview by um, Benita Fernando, who is actually one of the people who's written, who has had sort of covered the, the retrospective and did a, a really, really very touching um, interview with uh, Sudhir. And she really, I think, knew the kind of questions to ask. So this is what she says. For almost 50 years, Sudhir Patwadan has relentlessly put Mumbai on canvas after canvas. Little has escaped his painterly eye. The city's working class, the communal riots of 1992, the mill to mall progress in both construction and economy. In 2019, the artist's first retrospective opened at the National Gallery of Modern Art. Titled Walking Through Seoul City, it was curated by Nancy Adejanya and supported by Guild Art Gallery, with more than 200 works documenting the altering landscape. And Fernando asks him, as a young man, Man who relocated to Bombay from Pune in 1973. Um, and then he takes it on from there. He says, the scale of the city was one thing that really shook me. At that time, I was working at Mahatma Gandhi Memorial Hospital and then King Edward Memorial Hospital in Parel. Staying in Tartio or Girgao and traveling to Thane. The train went on and on. The city doesn't end. The images of workers were partly ideological because I was committed to the leftist ideology. But I had started to rethink it in the sense that the unions weren't doing the right things. So this is a really interesting comment for, for what I will be showing you next. Um, because the unions weren't doing the right things. Um, I had begun to question the utopian ideal of a classless society. The individual figures represented both the qualities of the class and they were individuals as well. But the crowd, he said, was also a positive thing for me. I wasn't entirely daunted. I loved being a part of it, climbing the footbridge at the railway platform or, or the feeling of everyone going in one direction. So this is Sudhir remembering back to his past of coming into the city, what he was seeing, the changing in industrial landscape and what he was painting. But very interestingly, also his view of labor, um, incredibly left um, and yet disappointed. And here I'm taking you through some of the exhibition images that you can sort of compare this kind of work to um, from the show itself. So here we've got Vincent Evans at the cool face, which was often used um, on our mm -hmm. poster. And again, you can see, um, I, I wanted to point out not just the idea of the laboring body, but something that we wanted to highlight in this show, um, one aspect of it mm -hmm. is called going down the mine. Um, and it's not to pre present any so sort of um, illusion about the fact that, you know, mining was a wonderful uh, experience. Um, it was also to be realistic about um, th that this was, that there was hardship involved um, and that the body, uh, while at one level, there was a tendency in painting to see it as uh, heroic. Um, there was also a, a reverse tendency to um, to uh, realize that the body is fragile, that it, um, you know, that that um, that uh, individuals and how they fit into this larger larger social scheme um, were not necessarily always or ever um, really happy um, 
uh, with going down the mines. And so we have the more heroic um, aspect. This is an installation view uh, of Joseph Herman's miners from 1951, which um, Ellie, who is the archivist at Glen Vivian, very clever, um, actually pointed out to me was made for the Festival of Britain. So this is a much more heroic presentation of miners. Um, and this is in some ways like the fulcrum of the show. But at the same time, uh, K Katie and I, when we were, you know, really keen to like um, hang the show, we created a separate space for it, rather dark, which we've called Going Down the Mines. Um, uh, because we wanted that feel both of sort of light and 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 shadow um and the sort of the the experience of being underground and as i said the idea that the that that the body is fragile that the, the laboring body is fragile and so here we also have when you're down the mines um you see these portrayals of miners which is one of the reasons i wanted you to look very closely at the severe image over here um, and again, in this case, at first glance, it looks a little bit sort of Soviet realist. Um, but the more you read into it, you realize that actually Isabella Alexander's miners were made in 1945. Um, she went, she came to uh, Wales, she went to Cornwall, and she started making these images of miners. Um, who had severe problems uh, as a result um, and severe ailments, um, eye, eye problems, uh, hearing difficulties, um, uh, fluid in their lungs because of mining. Um, and here's a work by Valerie Gantz. Again, one of the things we wanted to do was also focus on, you know, they're not enough um, women artists, it's often said, um, uh, who depict um, this kind of industrial um, whales, but there are quite a few in the Glen Vivian collection and we wanted to highlight those. This is also a work that um, I think Kerry Richards, uh, Kerry uh, Thompson will be talking about. Um, uh, perhaps not this specific work, but in, in their museum, they have quite a lot of gallery dance as well. So this is why I put this in here. Again, if you can see the sort of idea of light and shadow and something that I kind of really wanted to uh, highlight a little bit before moving on quickly now, um, is if you look at the different perspectives, so the way in which the eye enters uh, the paintings, that's something that uh, Sudhir Patwadan uh, makes a very uh, good comparison um, because equally you feel your eye entering at these very diverse uh, points. Um, there isn't a singular narrative um, because you're not just looking at something flat on. Every which direction in which you look, you have a different entry point into work like this. Um, so this is Sudhir's, this is his Nalla, and this is Tao. And um, this is exactly what I mean by the different kinds of entry points. So here you see, um, on the one hand, you can look head head on here. On the other hand, or, or looking, and he talks about it almost like an Italian uh, altarpiece. Um, so he's very influenced by um, Italian Renaissance painting. He's also incredibly influenced by Indian miniature painting. Um, and Studio Patwadan is also part of a larger tradition in the sort of, which came up in the 80s, um, in Baroda um, called the narrative figurative tradition. And so um, again, the presentation of the city, the presentation of the body, the way in which uh, we inhabit a city and a city under change um, that lives on top of each other as it were is something, this kind of layering is something that you can really pay attention to over here. Um, and then I just wanted to draw a contrast, particularly with this work, um, town, if you look at town and then you look at what we've got with, um, in the show, Archie Ruth Griffiths, Another Day. Um, again, diverse entry points, uh, both the presentation of the, of the, um, of, you know, the laboring body as, as a central, but also in some ways as, uh, dwarfed. And here a slightly more, um, 
a, a slightly more communal way of looking at, um, you know, the, the miners as a sort of social, as a social context of them, you know, gathering together, a little bit more nostalgic, perhaps. So this is this is um, a work from the contemporary uh, from the NGMA show that is really really contemporary, and I wanted to point it out to you. This is Sudhir, by the way. It's a seven panel work. It's stupendous. It's called Mumbai Proverbs. Also really interesting. I wanted to talk about it as a sort of end point, talking about uh, um, uh, Sudhir, um, because uh, you know of that use of Mumbai, not Bombay anymore, but Mumbai, and. He here you really see how the city has changed, how you see that, you know, um, the old city, the colonial city is toppling. Um, you see elements of the city of the past here, but it's also, it's living cheek by jowl with the new, the new Mumbai. Um, and if you look at this angle here, you can see the compute, you can see computers, you can see a sort of vast, um, almost like a sort of, uh, you know, sci-fi landscape happening here. Um, and it's something that I think uh, Ke uh, Kerry wants to talk about a little bit, that in the case of uh, uh, Bombay, what happens is that it, you know, the, the, the strikes, um, uh, which involve um, basically the shutting down of um, all the textile mills um, and huge unemployment, something like uh, 250,000 people are unemployed um, because of the strikes. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the, the sort of uh, the strike period um, as well. Uh, So um, what you have with the with the mill worker strike is that um, you know uh, all the mills sort of uh, uh, um, the mill workers go on strike through the unions, um, particularly one uh, uh, union leader um, is chosen, uh, Data Samant, and um, he leads this strike, um, uh, and. Indira Gandhi, uh, who's prime minister at this time, takes a very strong view of it, um, much like Thatcher, with whom she is friends, uh, actually. Um, and it becomes uh, an excuse then to shut down this yeah. entire district um, to huge unemployment. But the very fabric of the city changes because the mill workers actually lived in these areas. So, um, you know, with the disappearance um, of the mills, as it were, all of this area becomes prime real estate. Um, and with that comes the development of, um, you know, Mumbai, um, with the uh, with what uh, Benita Fernando like puts very neatly when she says from mill to mall, and that is basically the transition that you're seeing here. Um, so here again, uh, there's a comparison with um, with uh, Swansea and its environs and um, the. Um, shutting down of uh, in industrial rails um, with the mines. Um, and here you have uh, jack crab trees, really higgledy-piggledy uh, 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 landscape, um, which it's a work made in 1973-74. So that's really, um, that, that's quite telling. Like Ellie Dawson, the archivist at Glen Vivian, corrected me because I labeled it 80s and she said, no, 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 it's not 80s, it's 73, which means already before you have um, the Welsh um, uh, sort of the, the, the huge strikes, uh, you know, a lot of industrial Wales is already beginning to shut down in this. Um, in this uh, way. Um, and again, you have completely different entry points. It's, it's a montage. There's no one landscape that you can recognize here. And it's called Save This Pit. And uh, just to end with a few of the Sudhi Patwadin images, again, which talks about um, the dying city. So Bombay as dying, um, uh, as it becomes into Mumbai. 
um, and the things that it, it loses. So this one is a rather almost like sort of cubist leger like image. Um, Again, I mean, I'm quite fascinated by the visual equivalences between the kind of paintings that we're seeing, um, you know, with Sudhir and the kind of works that are there in the Glen Vivian show. I mean, there was, when I, when I first thought of this um, little introduction, I really wasn't, I, 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 Sudhir was on my mind, but it was only when I sat down and actually compared the images that I was like, oh, actually, there's such an equivalence. Um, and the sort of the, the kind of tradition of figurative painting also, um, which is very predominant um, when, when one is talking about industrial whales, which sort of really echoes um, what's ha what happened with um, you know, the Baroda school um, and the artists who worked within it and afterwards. And so there, as I said, is an exponent of that. In, in those years. Um, here you have, again, the Raj era city, the port at the back, um, and the Raj era city collapsing about our oh, years as it were, it seems to be on free fall. And here is my sort of like little ending bit of this is what um, the show looks like at the Glen Vivian. And here is again where we talk about um, uh, industrial whales and to what extent you know the the sort of the the, the death of the of, of mining which happens after the the miner strikes um again in the 80s and uh, Kerry will talk a lot lot more about that because he's an expert on these strikes but this particular work which is filled with overalls uh gloves um, electric circuits. So if you look from a distance at this work, um, you actually feel that you're getting an aerial view of the city and it's called Politics Eclipsed by Economics. I thought particularly telling um, in today's uh, Boris age, though perhaps these days it's economics eclipsed by politics, I don't know. And these are some images from uh, the, the minor strike here. Um, you, know, you can see them and I think uh, Kerry will come back and like sort of he even recognizes some of the people on this he's like giving us a, an account of who is where um, and this is again uh, this is the main union and again to tell you that this issue is not dead because as far as industrial uh, whales and the sort of demise of industrial whales goes um, uh, they Unlike Bombay becoming Mumbai, there isn't anything that has really replaced uh, industry. Um, and, uh, you know, there, there's uh, still, uh, there's huge unemployment here. Um, there isn't really an economy um, that came out of this, uh, uh, out of this period um, of, of extreme sort of of the strikes and then the sh uh, the, sh the the shutting down of the of the mines, um, this in a way in way in in our area in South Wales, uh, there hasn't really been an economy that takes over from this point. Don't want to labour the point too much. Um, and so here, these are just a few images that I'm going to show you in, in the context of Indian artworks that have also sort of handled um, ideas of uh, uh, coal mining. And this is Prajaka uh, Pachpute, um, uh, uh, Prabhakar Pachpute, um, whose work was shown at the Artist Mundi. Um, uh, a Welsh art uh, prize, just like the Turner Prize, so some, though some would say better. And here you have again this very strong um, uh, uh, Marxist, uh, communist, um, a fist coming up over here. And this work was presented in Cardiff Museum, or version of this work. Um, and so he's one artist who is an Indian artist who was shown in Wales. And then here is the amazing uh, Nikhil Chopra, who we've had on the Imperial Subject Series before, and Katie and I are rather obsessed with getting him um, to uh, Swansea 
uh, to be part of the Imperial Subject Exhibition. So I just thought I'd point him out to you here, but he has also talked about um, uh, equivalences between uh, India and uh, Britain and the, and the empire. And this is a work that he did called Call on Cotton um, at the Whitworth Art Gallery in Manchester. And here are some images, these sort of panoramic views again of, of the cityscape and the importance of uh, coal mining to the area, but also it's sort of larger questions of migration, colonial guilt, um, Etc. And these are the little things, uh, little um, are called sticks that he sort of uses to make his panoramic paintings. So now we're we're going to um, well let set sail, and I'm going to introduce uh, Kerry to you, and then he will take over and give us a sort of inside uh, look um, at uh, his uh, museum. So this is what. Kerry is going to talk about pit people and union, the coal industry in Wales. This talk will trace the connection between the coal industry and the people of Wales. Although unionism was slow to develop in Wales, it quickened at the end of the 20th century. And by 1914, the South Wales Miners Federation was the largest single trade union in Britain. The industry contracted in 1921, but remained important, especially during the oil crisis of the 1970s. This period saw um, the trade union uh, numb, winning two national strikes, but also led to the last great struggle of 1984-85. Um, and so this is Kerry's bio data. He left school at 16 and spent the next 16 years at the coal face um, in, in the colliery after redundancy in 1986, he um, attended uh, the college and since graduating, he worked in various museums and archives before becoming the curator of Big Pit um, in 1999. At present, he's researching the rescue and recovery of every aspect of the Aberban disaster. So I will now stop sharing. Do you want to do a share screen? Oh, oh my God, hang on. <laughs> okay, can you see that? Yeah. There we go. Okay. C can you see me as well, or can you only see the miners' badge? We can see you. Excellent. Right. Okay. I'll stop picking my nose now. Right. And Kerry Thompson has just been said, uh, created a big pit. Um, there's, there's not um, the coal industry in Wales is such a, an important topic that it's difficult to sort of place it down. But if you think about 200 years where coal basically dominated Welsh culture, industry, and just about everything else, sport, the lot. Um, just to put you, um, just to give you a bit of a pen picture of the, the area, there's actually two um, major coal fields in Wales. One in the north, uh, around the Wrexham area, right up to Ponte Bear uh, on the sea. Um, it, it's uh, flourished up until um, the, the beginning of the 20th century um, and was producing 3 million tonnes of coal in 1913. But afterwards it um, decreased and uh, the last pit point of air, uh, the closed in 1996. South Wales is probably the better known. Um, it extends from um, Armonford in the west to, to Pontypool in the east. Um, and it covers uh, an area of a thousand square miles. Um, one other thing about um, the coal uh, industry in Wales is that um, there's coal isn't coal isn't coal. So there's various types of coal which are used for various purposes. And uh, South Wales is remarkable for that in, in the entire world. Um, the major one, of course, in the late 19th century, what made us the tiger economy of the, of the world was steam coal uh, for shipping machinery and so on. Now then, um, one of the, the other big 
topics in the, the Welsh coal industry is uh, the amount of uh, disasters they were in the area. It became synonymous with these disasters. And between 1850 and 1920, a third of all mining deaths in Britain occurred in South Wales. Um, between 1890 and 1913, there were 27 major uh, mining uh, disasters. Um, the biggest ones, of course, was uh, the Gresford one in North Wales, which killed 266 in 1934. Um, then there was the Albion uh, in Kilvanith in 1894. And the biggest of all, of course, was the St. Enid colliery explosion, uh, well, the Universal colliery explosion in St. Enid, which killed 439 men. Okay, and that's right at the peak of the industry, which by that time uh, was employing a quarter of a million miners in 260 more, uh, 264 mines. Okay, so quite a huge part of the, the, the British coal fields. Um, just to have a look basically at the way the community involved, because basically the coal field was built on land which had previously just been small hill farms you know uh, isolated cottages on the hills okay so there wasn't a, a big population here to man the pits so of course people came in you know we got a huge immigrant population coming into wales with a huge melting pot from basically all over the world um uh, uh, anyway we'll probably go down a bit later on um on the way the the valley areas were um were built was on in small narrow valleys, um, all built around a coal mine. And basically, if you start at the beginning of the Ronda and then travel 17 miles uh, up the Ronda Vaur, you will think you're in the same street from Pontypris right up to Mardi. Okay, it's all one one area. Okay, it's very um, very very intense um, uh, um, area. Now, there's always been uh, a close relationship between the, the mine and the community, of course. Um, of course, like I said, it's because villages only came into existence because of the coal industry. And these villages were virtually uh, single occupation communities with large concentration of miners. In Glamorgan and Gwent, 50% um, of all adult male workers were directly involved in the coal industry. And in some areas, it went up to 75%. Okay, so there's a huge population all depending on this. Now, um, trade unionism itself was slow to develop for various reasons during the 19th century. But uh, uh, in 1893, only 45,000 of the 120,000 miners actually belonged to a trade union. Um, this was mainly because of the isolated nature of these villages um, and uh, other industrial uh, problems as well. But a six month lockout in 1898 um, brought the need for unity and from being the most backward of UK mining areas, South Wales, with 104,000 members, became one of the strongest. And by 1914, at the start of the First World War, the South Wales Miners' Federation was the largest single trade union in Britain, with 200,000 members. And of course, this uh, union played an important part in the life of the coal field itself. As Will Painter, um, president of the South Wales Miners' Federation, said, the Fed was more was a great deal more than just a trade union. It was both an industrial and social institution. And it differed from normal functions of trade union because of its more intimate involvement in the domestic and social life of the people. The Fed was the single decisive union operating in the pits. The communities only existed because of the pit and union branches were based upon it. Hence the integration of pit, people and union. Okay. Um, this gets lesser as the years go on. And by the 1980s, in spite of the fact that the coal industry was developed, uh, the coal industry was nationalized in 1947, um, the National Coal Board can be seen as actually um, shepherding closures, if you know what I mean, looking after the population as much as possible, but still closing pits down. Um, there were two major strikes, 1972 and 74. Um, they were basically over money. I took part in both of them, um, but they, they actually won. They uh, actually put down the Conservative government um, in 1974, which leads on to how Thatcher treated us in 1984. But anyway, by the early 1980s, um, there was more threats of uh, pit closures, 
And South Wales was particularly vulnerable due to its unprofit unprofitability and low productivity. Although earliest pit closures had been reluctantly accepted, the lack of alternative employment led to frequent calls for militant action. And in 1981 and 1982, the majority of Welsh miners were prepared to strike against this policy of pit closures. But by March 1984, the mood had changed, and only 10 of the 28 pits in South Wales gave support. But in spite of this, the strike went ahead, with only Point of Air Colliery in North Wales still in productivity in the spring of 1984. In South Wales, the strike continued for 12 months. The discipline of the Fed was such that only 6% of the 20,000 workforce abandoned the struggle by uh, March 1985. And on the 5th of March 1985, the miners marched back to work. You've seen the photograph from Mardi Colliery. Um, then they banners. And 18 months later, there were only 13,000 miners in South Wales in 16 pits. By 1990, there was 4,000 miners in 7,000 pit, pits. By the mid-1980s, there were more mining museums than there were collieries, working collieries. So by then, of course, one of the most important influences of the social, industrial and political life of modern Wales all but vanished. Okay? Um, we're still seeing uh, the remnants of, of the coal industry biting back. Um, there's been uh, worries about tips at the moment, which is something I'm doing um, in my Aberfan project um, and stuff like that. And also, of course, because of the, the nature of the coal industry, there wasn't really a lot of alternative employment. You know, only so many people can work in Tesco's. Um, so basically people living in the top of Merthyr will travel down to Cardiff, Newport, Swansea or what have you for work, okay? Um, but the, the valleys themselves have never seen real employment put in later, okay? Um, I actually, well, I'm a bit of a fraud here because I'm not an art historian, okay? So you'll have to excuse my... Uh, my, my treatment of art. Um, I started in Big Pit in 1999, although I'd worked in other museums and archives before that. And Big Pit itself was actually uh, developed from the the, the Blaenavon Colliery, uh, the Big Pit part of the Blaenavon Colliery, uh, which closed in 1980. Um, it was chosen as uh, a museum, basically because the coal board, the National Museum and, and other bodies wanted uh, a colliery kept where people could go underground, where visitors would go down the pit. And Big Pit was seen because it was quite shallow. Uh, it was self-draining and it was self-ventilating. It was seen as the ideal mining museum. Okay. Um, so all through its life, it's basically concentrated on getting people up and down the pit. That's, you know, and that's museum people have got to sort of fight against that because we're trying to actually function as a museum. But one of the joys of Big Pit is that um, the majority of workers there actually thinks it's still a working colliery and act as if it's a working colliery. Okay, they don't understand documentation, conservation and interpretation. Okay, so we've got to fight against that one. Um, the collections, um, when I took over the coal collections of the National Museum of Wales, because when Big Pit was brought into the, the seven sites of the Amgeva Cymru National Museum of Wales, uh, it had basically concentrated on the processes of mining, so picks, shovels, glass machinery, and what have you. Um, and I've tried to actually bring in more of the community. Uh, even disasters were seen as being not quite coal mining, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So we brought in things like that. We've also bring in um, the sport in activities, um, trade union activities. Again, that wasn't seen as being quite coal mining for some reason. Um, so to actually give a full picture of, well, Wales in the 1920th century, because of course it's dominant in the whole thing. Now, from the art point of view, oops, hang on. So this isn't your sort of your, your, your regular art, but if you look at the badge, you can see the various icons of the industry, which has um, been put into them. There's, We've got about a thousand strike badges in the collection, all different and all given the sort of the working class icon iconography, like white doves, uh, clenched fists, you know, black and white hands shaking together, you know, that type of thing. And I don't think if anybody done a study of this, but this is working class heraldry here. 
So I think it's a, it's a very important thing to keep and to understand what these things actually show, if you know what I mean. Now, this is a, an unusual strike badge. This is actually um, the design for the lesbian and gay support the minors badge. Um, those of you who have seen the film Pride will have followed uh, the fortunes of the, the lesbian and gay community, uh, basically uh, based around Gays the Word Bookshop in London, who came to the Delice Valley, joined in with the local women's support group and provided funds and a, and a van at one time and joined them on the picket lines and what have you. And if you haven't seen the film, it's worth seeing. It's slightly Holly, Hollywoodized, but not too much. Okay. So this is actually shows the design. And again, you've got the iconography on there. You've got the, the male symbol, the female symbol, the headgears on there, and also the pink triangle. And the pink triangle, of course, is what um, the, the Nazis put on the uniforms of concentration camp. Um, so um, LGBTQ people in concentration camps, they, they carry the pink triangle. So that's part of the design of the badge. Now, the other art we've got, which hasn't been mentioned, I think, before, is the photographic art. Um, and we attend again, uh, just to explain again, there is an actual an art department where people know what they're talking about, collect stuff, okay? But again, I normally, within conjunction with those, I collect the amateurs who's doing this. Now, this photograph was taken by um, a coal worker called Mike Thompson, who worked in where I'm speaking from today, uh, the old Nangaru Colliery. And uh, he was an amateur photographer who was invited along to a demonstration in the north of England. And they said, take a camera with you. It'll be a lovely day. We'll have a picnic and all sorts of things. When he went up there, it turned into a police riot. There was prams being pushed over. There was people being beaten up and all sorts of things. So he decided then to take as many photographs from the picket line as possible including this one, which, of course, shows nurses and youngsters and what have you. It's quite a poignant one because the little boy in the centre died of a drug overdose in the 1990s, OK, which shows, you know, and that's become rife since the cold industry have shut. Okay. This is my favourite uh, photograph, I think. Um, this is a very famous wrestler called Adrian Street. Um, who actually worked in um, in, in um, Blinder Colliery, came back for a visit. Uh, now, Adrian was known as the sweet transvestite transvest, right, with the armour in his hand, OK? Uh, and those of you who remember the wrestling program at five o'clock on a Saturday afternoon will remember him there. In a way, he's a bit of an art installation on his own, isn't he? The chap on the left is his father, who looks a bit askance at him, OK? But Wayne himself worked underground at one time. Oop, hang on, where's my finger? Um, again, we're looking at amateur art here. Um, this is Merthyr Vale Colliery, which, strangely enough, is actually um, the colliery where, um, by Arbor Van, uh, where the tip came from. And this painting, which was done in about 1902, I think, because I can't see the date there, um, done in 1902, is actually taken from the tip site. So you can see how the village is in between the colliery. Um, so very interesting. The, the name is on here, uh, but it came to us by an, uh, an auction house. Um, I think they gave it to us, actually, because they, they wanted it to go to a mining museum because they thought it was it was important. But we don't actually know who, who the, um, the artist was. Now, I know who the artist was on this one. This is Thomas John, uh, John Broom, and he's the great, great uncle of one of the guides in Big Pit, uh, who was involved in the Sengene disaster of 1913. Uh, seeing any of the disaster, of course, the worst disaster in UK uh, mining history. And this shows a, a widow basically um, in despair in her cottage. And in the background through the door, you can see um, bodies being brought up from underground. Um, it was the practice that if somebody was injured, they would be carried at waist height. And if they were dead, they were carried at shoulder height. OK, so that's quite interesting detail in the photograph. You can see they actually at the... Uh, I, um, I've checked into this photograph and you can't actually see the colony from any of the houses in Abbeval, uh, in, um, in uh, St. Enneth. So there's a bit of artistic license for there. But again, it's a naive painting, but it's a very powerful one. And it, it's done by an, an amateur artist who wanted to portray something in their own mind. Um, again, this, this is what we concentrate on with our art collections. I don't know if you can see all this one, can you? Yeah. 
Um, this isn't particularly art, but to be honest with you, this is very artful, isn't it? You know, it um, it's actually a, a silver-mounted ho um, horse's hoof. Um, it's from a horse called Kildare, um, who was involved some way in the Singhani disaster again. And um, this was donated to us by the family of an ostler at Singhani in 1913. And that's all it says was Kildare, Singhani Colony. So we don't really know whether, whether Kildare was killed underground um, or survived later and then was mounted later because the family didn't know, basically. But it's interesting to see that they thought it was important enough to actually make something of. And this is silver, you know, so somebody really thought it's important. Um, and it's interesting to see how the relics of the, the mining industry actually become art. Well, this is uh, one of my favourites. Um, we, uh, I haven't got a Valerie Garns to show you, but this gentleman was working about the same time as, as Valerie uh, was in, involved. And of course, um, we don't really think of it this way, but Jack Crabtree and Valerie Garns were both employed by the National Coal Board. Okay, so they were basically mine workers. So as far as I'm concerned, that's fair game for my collection. Okay, but this is uh, Chopper Davis, John Davis. I don't know why he was called Chopper. Probably something dubious, but he was a haulage engine driver underground in Six Bells Colliery. A um, bit of an amateur artist. Um, the painting he's got in his hand was one he was working on when he was called out to help um, after the disaster. He should have actually been involved in it, but he had swapped shifts. Okay, so he, he was saved. But um, just before the disaster, he was working on this little painting he's got in his hands for there. And um, he hadn't finished it, but he was called out then, of course, to help with the, the rescue and the recovery at um, Six Bells Colliery. And after a couple of weeks, he, he got his mind back together and decided to, to carry on with his painting. And he looked at the painting, because he used to paint in his attic, uh, he looked at the painting and he, and he thought one of the figures he had painted in there hadn't been painted before the disaster. So he always reckoned that it was a, a, the ghost in the painting itself. Yeah? Um, he later went on to large scale paintings, like the one behind him, but they all basically show the scene he could see underground from his haulage engine. OK, he painted what he could see. Again, naive in style, but uh, again, very powerful. Um, a little bit of story about Chopper, because um, after he died, and I met Chopper a few times, um, the heaviest smoker I've ever seen in my life. He'd have one fag in his mouth, he'd have another fag on the mantelpiece, and he'd be rolling another one in his hands, right? And he continuously smoked drum, which is a strong tobacco. Yeah. Um, anyway, when he died, <laughs> probably a chest disease, as you imagine, um, his daughter came up to us and said, would you like some of his paintings? Because Chopper had painted about 450 large canvases, which were all piled up in the, in the bedroom upstairs. So we obtained six of them. Anyway, I asked her what happened to the famous picture with the ghost in it. And she looked a bit quiet and well, and then she said, oh, we buried it with him. So this painting is actually buried alongside Chop. Yeah? Interesting character. Um, again, this is more of a professional one. This is Barnett Samuels who painted uh, Edward VII and various personalities, but it actually shows uh, a very important member of the of the of the legend of South Wales Coal. This is uh, Dr. Henry Norton Davis, um, who was a colliery surgeon for twelve different colonies in the Rhondda area, and um, of course took part in in the eight, the first big explosion in in Britain, basically in Camar in 1856, and went on until about 1898 when he died. Uh, like I said, took part in about up to 20 major explosions uh, as a surgeon. Um, because he was involved in the Tinewid uh, disaster of 1877, which was quite a small disaster, um, in spite of being a small disease where there was uh, five men trapped, um, it actually became a huge media event. And for that disaster, the rescuers, there was 25 of the rescuers received Albert medals and uh, a vast amount of silverware. It was a huge, it's one of the biggest collections we got in anything, biggest collections in the disaster we got, because so much material was given out to people. Yeah? 
Henry Davis um, wasn't actually given an Albert Medal, even though he was underground waiting for the medal to be brought out. But he was given a, a medal by the British Medical Association in 1877, um, the gold medal, and some of his team had other medals. Um, and he became a huge personality in the Valleys, right? created the first cottage hospital. So that's, the, again, the type of thing we do. We've just been offered um, John Hughes, uh, who was an iron master from Merthyr, iron master and coal owner from Merthyr, who actually developed the Donetsk coal field in Ukraine. So that's quite current, okay? But that hasn't come to us yet. So we do collect that type of thing. Again, it, they're not great paintings. They're not marvellous paintings. The art department will look at them and say, well, I don't like the, the technique in there. But it's what they actually show, you know, that's important to us. Hmm? That's, and that's it from up there. Okay, I'm not sure how long I've been speaking for. Quarter to an hour, yeah. Okay, um, is there any questions or shall I um, carry on? So what I thought we'd do is that um, if we uh, if we uh, move on to Samuel, sorry, I don't know what happened there. <laughs> <laughs> Gobbling up something. Um, and let me ooh, try and do a... Um, I'm going to try and do a screen share and quickly introduce Samuel or what, what happened there. Hi, um. Have I blocked myself out or something? No, you're okay. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, what we'll do is that um, we'll follow Samuel's talk with question and answer. And then, so if you guys can like save the questions for when we can sort of uh, connect it all up. Um, so that Dr. Samuel Rabel, um what Samuel's going to be looking at today is landscapes of the Welsh imagination, art industry, and impressionism. So this is what he's arguing a little bit. Landscapes have offered nations narrators a recurrent metaphor, bringing together the deep past and the collective present. Post-colonial theorist Homi K. Baba's disjunctive vision of the modern nation resonates closely with the cultural construction of modern Welshness explored by this exhibition. Um, so Samuel Raybon is an art historian from Aberystwyth University. He specializes in the history and historiography of Impressionism. His current research examines transnational and decolonial approaches to Impressionism, including the complex relationships between transnational circuits and national imaginaries in the collection, display, and reception of Impressionism in Wales. Um, and so we're absolutely delighted to have um, Samuel here, uh, you know, helping re uh, kind of um, make a connection with ideas of landscape. Um, also notions of the sublime, which he's uh, really great at speaking about in the context with uh, of um, ideas of the deep past and how uh, Wales's industrial history does or does not feed into that uh, language. Thank you very much, Sarah. Can you all um, hear me okay? Fantastic, cool, I'll shut and start sharing the screen. Um, thank you, Zira, for that, for that really warm um, introduction. And, and as you say, um, I'm hoping to, to talk for about 15 minutes, um, as Kerry did. Um, and hopefully not, not propose something that's too dense and, and tangled and, and academic to follow, but rather pose some general questions and, and provoke some sort of talking points that we can take up together um, in the final um, session. No, well, well, session. Um, so I, I began my abstract with a quote from um, post-colonial theorist Homi Baba, and I'm going to do the same here, because he defined uh, and wrote about nations like narratives, 
lose their origins in the myths of time and only fully encounter their horizons in the mind's eye. As a system of cultural signification, um, for Homi Kibaba, the nation condenses disjunctive forms of representation while seeming to articulate the spatial expression of a unitary people, irrepressibly ambivalent um, and plural narratives and identities always coexist within the cultural construction of nationness. The ambivalence of the nation, which is for Barber a product of modernity, indexes the ambivalence of modern society itself. And as the exhibition, um, uh, Zira's exhibition uh, uh, explores, and that's a chair, I, I have not been lucky enough to visit in person, but I, I have taken advantage of the fantastic um, digital tour that they have on the website. So if Zira's talk, whet your appetite, but you haven't had a chance to visit the galleries physically, um, you, should, you should certainly have a look at that. Um, as I found this exhibition exploring, um, landscapes as a form of representation have offered nations narrators a recurrent metaphor bringing together the deep past and the collective present. Moreover, I found that Barber's disjunctive vision of the modern nation as a general form resonates closely with the particular history of Wales um, that this exhibition mounts. Um, with that is the, the complex cultural dynamics through which modern Welshness was constructed. As Di Smith, as John Davies and Peter Lord, among many others, have identified, the complexity of those dynamics hinged on a disjunction between the two senses in which we might say Wales or modern Welshness was constructed. In art, Wales was made in the image of a rugged wilderness dominated by sublime mountains and picturesque ruins. In reality, as, as Kerry has so vividly shown, modern Wales was forged in the urban and industrial tumult that began in earnest in the 19th century. So in this talk, in the 15 minutes I have, I'm going to make some very brief points about what that conjunction meant in the context of the longer history of the cultural construction of Wales via the representation of its landscape, touching on the collection and display of Impressionist landscapes in South Wales in the early 20th century. As I said, my aim is not to be hopefully uh, too dense or advance an overly complex argument, but instead just to raise some broad issues and provoke perhaps some pointed questions. I'm not going to examine uh, the detail of the history. And what I want to do instead is focus our attention on one crucial problematic that I think possesses a, a much wider relevance. And that is the special potency of landscapes within what Barbara calls the cultural construction of nationness. If perhaps I, I can be um, permitted to try and boil everything down into, into one point, it's really that nations are not inevitable and landscapes are not natural. That they both seem to be so, I think, tells us a great deal about the power they hold over us. This is a topic, of course, that, that many scholars have examined. And using Barber's terms, this special potency, I think it really does make intuitive sense. The landscape as an artistic form is uniquely capable of giving a spatial expression to an imagined community via geological features, via natural cycles, via ancient ruins. Landscapes can conjure the deep past, those myths of time, and they can shroud the nation's relatively recent origins and naturalize its constructiveness. Nevertheless, by the same token, historians of Impressionism which was an artistic movement which kind of famously eschewed that deep time in favour of the fleeting second, um, the sort of experience of presentness in the here and now. Historians of Impressionism have examined how its emphasis on subjective aesthetic experience and instantaneous temporality also empowered artists across the globe to ostensibly capture something of a national essence by a direct communion with the land. And historians have been looking about how that um, capability was put into service um, for a variety of different projects, um, including the erasure of 
native peoples in, in settler colonies um, such as Australia um, to the resistance against cultural suppression in partitioned Poland. So different kinds of landscapes in different kinds of contexts have been similarly potent, powerful, flexible cultural vehicles for um, telling national stories, um, constructing national identities. So it was in early 20th century Wales, a historical moment of resurgent cultural nationalism, that the disjunction between cultural representations and lived realities manifest in alternative landscape aesthetics vying for prominence in the burgeoning public sphere and, na and nascent cultural institutions. For its early advocates in Britain, um, who were active at this time, uh, Impressionism was something that was intrinsically modern. It, it represented modern life, but most crucially, uh, crucially, it inculcated a modern way of seeing, um, unfettered, vivid and fearless. In Wales, as in France, Impressionism captivated those whose fortunes were made through industry, Gwendolyn and Margaret Davis and Francois de Paul. And via their benefaction, Impressionism was made accessible to industry's toiling masses. In 1911, Dupont donated six uh, Rouenais Impressionist paintings to the Glyn Vivian to celebrate its opening. And in 1914, he lent 43 canvases for an exhibition. In 1913, the Davis sisters funded, um, uh, funded an exhibition from their private collection, the first under the auspices of the new National Museum in Cardiff, and as I've argued um, elsewhere at greater length, um, I see that exhibition as a argument in favour of Impressionism to be the catalyst for a Welsh artistic renaissance. The Davis Sisters collection was also shown in Swansea in 1914 in, in parallel to the Dupont collection. What we have here then is an arrival, uh, uh, the arrival of a particular way of representing the landscape that was understood at the time to be acutely modern. And it's arriving at the very same moment that people in Wales and especially um, nationalist commentators were um, identifying and, and sort of debating a sense of necessity to reconstruct their idea, their sense, their definition of Welshness in the maelstrom of modernity and industrialisation. And Significantly, the arrival of Impressionism predated by some decades the concerted effort made by Welsh artists later in the 20th century to reflect the nation's industrialisation. So we're at this moment of, of intense industrialisation, modernisation, um, debates in the public sphere in Wales about what Wales is and what it means to be Welsh, we have Impressionism arriving into this mix via the um, benefaction and activity of um, individuals who'd made their fortune through industry. At the very same moment, the National Museum's first major purchase was this Carnarvon Castle by Richard Wilson. It was also celebrated in that first exhibition by the museum as the founder of Welsh landscape art. Then. As now, Wales, um, borrowing a phrase used by the curators uh, here, um, was pictured as an Arcadian la-la land. And this Arcadian la-la land sat uncomfortably alongside the messy complexity of industrial modernity. Wilson bathed the Welsh mountains in the subtle, sometimes golden tones of classical Italy balancing carefully trees with buildings and bucolic figures with picturesque ruins. He's transforming Wales into a serene, idyllic and beautiful Arcadia. In solitude, as we see here, Wollstone combines this static classicism with a particularly Celtic iconography, picturing a medieval bard contemplating his natural surroundings. 
the particular cultural power that this um, vision of Wales has attained, I think, stems from its utility for the Welsh nationalist intelligentsia of the late 18th century and their successful strategy of, as Pris Morgan has argued, inventing an ancient past and living that past in the present through the formation of learned societies like the Fumaroderon and the Grinadigion, the, the publication and indeed fabrication of medieval Welsh manuscripts and poetry, and the only ostensible resuscitation of the ancient social rights of Druids and Bards, the revived social rights, including the Gorsef and Estedvore. Wilson, though, was nevertheless painting for the English art world. And, <clears throat> pardon me, as English tastes changed from the classical to the romantic, so too did representations of the Welsh landscape change in turn. Edmund Burke's 1757 inquiry into the nature of the sublime and the beautiful, and William Gilpin's 1770 observations on the River Wye in several parts of South Wales. These publications primed artists and their viewers to identify and value the sublimity of rugged mountains, gloomy valleys and crashing waterfalls, or else, on the other hand, seek picturesque vistas balancing harmony with a touch of wildness. Nevertheless, here again, landscape painting is making the deep past palpable. Uh, Turner, Turner's, watercolors, uh, Turner's watercolors of Tintin Abbey are typical for this moment in time for the way in which they articulate Wales as wild, ancient and indeed unchanging. Ironically, while the Welsh nationalist intelligentsia often based in London were plumbing the myths of time for inspiration and legitimation for contemporary cultural politics and um, using um, a sense of Wales's deep um, historic cultural identity um, as part of the fabrication of new identities and social practices um, in the present, as, indeed as was the case around Europe. In the wider cultural sphere, the consequence or, or one consequence of the habitual association of Wales with the deep past was to articulate the nation as, um, in the words of um, Matthew Crago, uh, as something that had happened long ago, thereby neutralizing national political agency in the present. So there's something profoundly um, depoliticizing about this um, construction of Wales as something that has been and gone and happened. So even at this very early moment in the history of industrialization in Wales, it's being erased from the representations of the Welsh landscape. James Daring has pointed out that as Gilpin was floating down the River Wye, his determination to see a picturesque Wales led him to studiously, deliberately ignore all the commercial river traffic that surrounded him. And he barely mentioned the iron furnaces dotted along the river. Likewise, um, she says, romantic searches of solitude were able to uh, ignore the shafts of copper mines on Snowdon, the great gashes made in the mountains of Merioneth by the thriving slate quarries, the coal mining of Denby and Flint. Nowhere is there a hint of the industrial. And indeed, at this moment, nowhere was there a hint of industrial workers. For the painters of mythic wild Wales, um, the actual inhabitants of the place were often valued um, only, in, and I'm borrowing Peter Lord's very evocative phrase here, as bucolic furniture. Other painters like um, David Cox and um, others who joined him in the artist colony of Better Sequoid did seek to represent those lives lived on the land, but they chose to represent rural village folk 
and of course, I, I don't need to explain the importance and the, and the prominence of, of David Cox's Welsh funeral as an icon of Welsh identity um, starting in the middle of the 19th century. Um, but we can see here how it, how it presents uh, an, an idea of Welshness um, tied to this village community in, in harmony with nature, um, the picture space ensconced by these rising mountains, um, uh, creating this sense of closeness um, community. Um, it, it depicts the village attending a funeral of, of a local girl. He's visualizing this strong community bonded by their common faith, common language, um, and close connection to the landscape. At this moment in time, this particular configuration of Welshness was still something of a work in progress. Writers like Samuel Roberts, known as S.R. <coughs> pardon me, and Henry Richard were penning essays on the land question, the rural social unrest and economic underdevelopment that kind of blighted the period. And they and other um, Patriotic Welsh writers were busy countering the, the, the accusations of the Blue Books commissioners. And in so doing, um, as Matthew Cragoy has noted, they schematised for the first time in the mid-19th century the cultural qualities of those who were to be considered members of the Welsh nation, i.e. Welsh-speaking nonconformists and those who were not the landed Anglian, uh, Anglican aristocracy. So what we might think about Cox doing here is um, coining a landscape aesthetic that allowed for a spatial expression of this newly minted unitary people. Yet, yeah, of course, like every single claim to universality, this construction of Welshness was founded on, relied on myriad exclusions and silences. And of course, it's, it's obvious to us in the context of this panel and, and, and the conversation that we're having, the big exclusion of that definition of Welshness was, of course, industrial modernity. Industrial modernity, by as early as 1895, embodied reality for the majority of the inhabitants of Wales. And so hopefully so far, I, I've just given some, some background on on, on the enduring prominence of, of Richard Wilson in the canon of Welsh landscape art, but also perhaps given some context to the appearance of and support for Impressionism um, during the formative years of national artistic institutions in Wales and in the midst of fraught debates about national identity and the cultural representation of the nation. In Cardiff in, in 1913, and, and this is the exhibition that I've been um, focusing on, um, I hope you'll forgive me that it's not the Glyn Vivian exhibition, um, but in Cardiff in 1913, the, the landscapes of French Impressionism were presented um, as the culmination of, uh, as the curator said, um, what is greatest in the art of the last century. And they hoped that Impressionism would be, quoting the, the curators again, um, Hugh Blaker and Molly Urquhart, a catalyst for a long delayed revival in Welsh art. And, and that, of course, was one of the big nationalist hopes of the time of the early 20th century, that um, uh, uh, somehow Welsh art could be um, ignited and inspired and that would be a, a massive boon for the, the argument for um, a distinctively Welsh identity as a cultural and, and increasingly over time political project. Impressionism, quoting the exhibition catalogue, the art of the quote modern landscape, constituted one of the most revolutionary changes of modern times. And so I think it, it, it makes sense that it would be thought at the time acutely relevant to Wales, itself undergoing revolutionary changes and the product of visual and textual representations of landscapes that those revolutionary changes, i.e. industrialisation, were rendering obsolete. Nevertheless, 
Although many responded favorably to the great French modern art, those old ideas of Welshness revealed their tenacity. One particular reviewer of the exhibition, um, uh, who, who supported Impressionism, but kind of mixed it very tellingly with received ideas of, of what it means to be Welsh, which I find particularly fascinating. Um, for one reviewer, he said um, it was great that the, the, the curators had, had brought Impressionism to Wales and tried to introduce it to um, uh, ordinary Welsh people because Impressionism was particularly suited to ameliorating Welshness. Not because it was modern though, but because the Impressionists transformed the landscape into what he called a poetry of colour. In fact, I think, um, yeah, this is a nice one. Um, so he says the Impressionists transformed the landscape into a, quote, poetry of colour. And because their aim was to stimulate emotions, he felt that this resonated with, quote, the Celt's love of poetry, of music, of mysticism, of spiritual ideas. And so he's kind of dredging back up that bardic realm of Wilson, of Turner, and at root, the literary historian um, Matthew Arnold. So if the nation then is a narrative articulated in part through the visual representation of landscapes that purport in some way to convey its essence, it's really important for us, I think, to trace the ambivalence the malleability and the contingency of those representations. And I think it's equally important for us um, in the here and now to challenge the claims to universality, to uniformity or to purity that are often made with reference to landscapes. It's important equally, and I, I haven't dwelled on this in the talk for the sake of time, but I just want to raise this point at the end, to note the permeability of national boundaries and to examine the ways in which the cultural construction of the nation always hinges the processes of exchange, translation and hybridization that, that permeate across that mix national contexts. The industrial history that saw Francois de Paul identify with Swansea, he owned a coal mine obviously nearby, um, and that, that shared industrial history that, that led him to want to introduce the people of Swansea to the Impressionist art, which, as he said, originated in France. There's a desire to share culture across national boundaries. That transnational industrial history that saw the Davis sisters importing canvases from Parisian shops to mid Wales and later share them with people um, in Cardiff and Swansea. I appreciate that this isn't a particularly new or a particularly insightful point, but, but taking the opportunity that this exhibition offers to rethink how national identities are made and the exclusions that those processes entails, um, what I hope then this, this very brief and very potted history highlights, um, and, and returning to that point I made at the start, is that there's nothing national, uh, there's nothing natural about the nation uh, uh, and nor indeed nothing natural about the landscape. Thank you very much. And hopefully I was, I was about on time, perhaps I, I went over slightly, sorry about that. No, thank you, thank you. I, I, I First of all, I just want to thank you uh, all, Samuel, Kerry and Zara. This has been um, educational, intriguing, and I really hope it left you all with a bit of uh, wanting to know more about this. And there is definitely a lot to research maybe you can have in the future. <laughs> and uh, as, as Samuel said, um, there is an online virtual tour on our website of the exhibition that Zara was talking about. If, uh, um, and that will be online. And unfortunately, the exhibition closes this weekend uh, on Sunday. So who can, if you want to come down to Swansea, to the gallery, to see the exhibition, please, please do. <laughs> um, so yes, um, thank you all. Uh, Zara, do you want, if there's anything um, you want to add or if there are any questions? Um, yeah, I mean, I thought we I sort of um, take the opportunity to like make a little link and then open it up for questions because uh, I think people did want to ask things. Um, first of all, I, uh, 
Thank you, Samuel, for that. And I, I think what is um, especially fascinating to me is that particular construction of Welshness that you're that you're looking at. That in a way, a lot of the discussions that Ellie, um, uh, 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 who's Ellie Dawkins, who's the uh, archivist, like Vin Vivian, and I have been having as well, totally links in with what you're saying. Is that why why is it these um, kind of big industrialists when they collect um, art or you know when when they sort of support a particular version of Welshness that they're actually not depicting and they don't necessarily want depicted what they're making their money from and instead you have this vision of a kind of um, a deep past, a Celtic, Bardic, um, myths and legend, uh, which feeds into a particular vision of um, nationalism, a kind of organic nationalism, which to me specifically is really interesting um, in the sense that a similar thing is happening in India. Um, and I do wonder whether just putting it out there, that in some sense, this is the point at which the post- coloniality of both Wales and India can actually, you can make a link. Um, for the simple reason is that kind of cultural nationalism as it's presented by the British in India, Turner and views after Turner, which you can find at the Tate, almost exactly uh, the same kind of elegic, uh, at one level elegic, but also full of ruins and, um, you know, another kind of la-la land, not necessarily Arcadian in an Indian context, because, you know, those despotic rulers, which are being replaced by the wonderful British. Um, and this kind of cultural nationalist space that is then utilized by, you know, freedom struggles within India. Um, but also which fit into seeing uh, India as this sort of ancient civilization without focusing on any kind of modernity in that particular dialogue. And whether what we're seeing in Wales at almost exactly the same time with the concentration on Richard Wilson and that, that whole sort of myths and legend Wales is another way of talking about um, an unproblematic uh, Welshness, because you don't have to deal with labor. You don't have to deal with the fact that, you know, these are periods where you have um, uh, um, workers in distress uh, with labor movements that have already started um, by this point. And so, you know, you don't have to deal with any of this sort of um, uh, the guilt or the realities of where your money is coming from, really. Instead, you buy in to a larger idea of Welshness that is very nice for a drawing room. And I wonder if one could actually pick up on that a little bit in the discussion and maybe bring Kerry, I mean, uh, first of all, like what Samuel thinks about that. And second of all, Kerry, do you think that in some ways, I'm putting it out there and you can like disagree with me, this dialogue continues, and there are contradictions in this dialogue in Wales today, continues to exist with pride on the one hand and labour on the other, particularly Welsh labour. Uh, there's a difference in pride these days to the one there was in the 1930s and 1930s. Okay, interesting. Yeah. yeah. But um, it's interesting that Gwynar Williams, the historian from Merth, had actually joined Plaid Cymru towards the end of his life. We mm -hmm. saw that it had changed a bit. And I think these days, basically, uh, Labour and Clyde are, are interchangeable, you know, in, in you know, certain people. And uh, you mm -hmm. know, um, my family were all communists um, rather than Labour. And I think we all turned over the Clyde Company from the Communist Party. But uh, mm -hmm. that's a good interesting one. Also, looking at the Druids and uh, magical spaces of Wales, it's interesting to note that uh, one of the first big miners leader was uh, at the Bardic <coughs> name, Marbon. Which was mm. from the Mabinogia, who was the Christ figure within the, the Mabinogia, the great son. You know, um, we've also got uh, a nice dead the chair in, in, the, in the collection uh, by a chap called Thomas George, who was the first uh, chair bard in the Cannon Valley. Um, his uh, actual bardic name was a Seth Luke, which is the early name for um, South Wales, South uh, Eastern Wales. Uh, and he was killed underground two weeks after he won the chair. On the core face, you know. So mm -hmm. this idea comes into the early coal industry, you know, and I think most of it sort of is destroyed by the First World War, basically. But you can see amongst all these people, there's interesting poetry and Welsh culture and all sorts of things, you know. 
and then that sort of disappears in the, the first decade, two decades of the 20th century. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. I, I really should. I, I suppose we should be speaking in in, in the plural of Welshnesses and Welders, really, in, in terms of those kind of this multiplicity of, of cultural identities, um, and, and that have exactly as you sort of alluded to, Zira. Um, uh, and there's a sort of geographical element uh, uh, to that as well, but also um, a, a class element. And, and that was one thing that perhaps struck me as, as very significant as, as a difference between the material that, that Kerry and I were dealing with. As, um, I think, Kerry, you, you made that point very strongly and, and, and evocatively that, that, that the objects that you conserve at, at Big Pit are um, sort of the uh, inside view of of those experiences are kind of self-authored their their self-expression it's it's not some sort of outsider you know coming in and 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 depicting it how they think it should be it's it's the people's lives themselves you know conserved on the canvas and okay you know the the perspective might not be very good but there's there's uh, the authenticity of it as as a document of an experience is is what's significant rather than you know technical skill um exactly as you say and and on the other hand the, the material that sort of I've been looking at from, from Richard Wilson through to the Impressionists, it's an entirely different class of people who are conserving these and, and can afford these and, and are showing these. And, and often with a perhaps paternalistic isn't, isn't quite the right word, but with that sense of um, wanting to ameliorate the cultural condition of the toiling masses, you know, these ignorant miners who... It's not their fault they don't get any time to go to exhibitions. So let's let's raise you know raise the standard up um, in in like in a very condescending way. So I think Zero's point absolutely is that is uh, I, I agree completely that that when we think about nations and representations of nations, we, we we can't divorce that from class. And there are class distinctions within a national context, but also um, homologies, similarities of class across national context. So it struck me that a lot of the similarities era that you were trying to draw between Wales and India in your talk bespeak to this um, uh, almost kind of Marxist idea of the, the centrality of class as, as a, a defining um, aspect of experience as opposed to national identity. Um, as, as similarities kind of coming through there, yeah. Thank you all again, and um, thank you for joining us, and thank you for uh, listening. Um, thank you to um, Samuel, Kerry, and Sarah for leading on this discussion, and um, for uh, you will find um, all information and the recording of the talk and more resources on the website, um, on the Glen Vivian website, but also this new website that we will be launching in the. Uh, next couple of weeks together with Science Gallery um, uh, Bangalore. Um, thank you, thank you all, and uh, we'll see you soon. So.